Ciao everyone, this is Nate on the Stone. Welcome back to my channel. And today we are going to be talking about the number one worst thing in Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's new Green Deal. But before we dive into that, just as a reminder that if you like videos about the culture, politics, and religion from a different POV, then don't forget to give the video a like and to subscribe to the channel. Freshman, or woman, congresswoman, or person, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has unveiled her much-heralded New Green Deal, and it is, to put it diplomatically, nuts. It ties climate change to everything you could think of. Wage stagnation, economic inequality, quote, systematic racial, regional, social, environmental, and economic injustices. Immigration, national security, you name the issue, whatever it is, the New Green Deal says that climate change is the reason why the problem exists. And its solutions are just as crazy, from demanding that every building in the country be made green friendly, to demanding that 100% of the energy demand in the country be clean with 0% emissions, to universal education. But the thing that really made me do a double take when I was reading through the resolution was the part where it said that economic security would be guaranteed to all Americans even if they were unable to work and even if they were unwilling to work. Now, if you actually read the resolution itself, House Resolution 109, which I've linked to in the description, you're not going to find this specific language. The closest that you're going to get comes at the very end, where it's stated that one of the goals of the Green New Deal is to, quote, provide all people of the United States with economic security, unquote. However, the language specifying that this included people unable and unwilling to work was included in an overview of the resolution, which Congresswoman Cortez's office put up on her website before it was taken down. Now, Congresswoman Cortez took to Twitter to explain that there were several doctored versions of the Green New Deal and FAQs circulating the internet, and that a rough draft of the overview had been uploaded onto our website before it was taken down. And sure, we might be able to accept those excuses, but they don't paper over two important facts. First, it was her office that put up the overview of the resolution that included that language, and two, the resolution itself, as it's written right now, still implies this. Because if you think about it, if all people of the United States are going to be provided for economically, like the resolution says, then that has to include people who are unable to work and unwilling to work, because otherwise, not everyone in the United States would be guaranteed economic security. And this is the worst thing about the Green New Deal. It's one of the worst things about socialism in general. It's not so much the money that's wasted or the impossibility of the goals that it sets out, as bad and as impossible as they are. It's the fact that by promising economic security to everyone in the U.S., what the resolution does is warp people, making people dependent on the government and squashing their potential. If your resolution and your deal guarantee that everyone is going to be provided for by the government no matter what, then the implication behind that idea is that work is bad and that we, as individuals and as people, aren't supposed to help other people. It doesn't matter if ideologues protest that this isn't what they intended, the implication is still there. Let's take the first implication, that work is bad. If you don't want to work, and I'm not talking about changing careers or a job, because those can be legit, but you genuinely don't want to work at all, at anything, and the government still promises to provide you with economic security, which the International Committee of the Red Cross defines as, quote, the ability of individuals, households, and communities to cover their essential needs with sustainability and dignity, unquote, which is a very vague definition, FYI, what the government is saying is that work is at best unnecessary and at worst actually harmful. Because what the government is saying by its action is that you don't have to work for those things. They should just be provided for you. But this gets everything wrong that it possibly could about work. 
Because the truth of the matter is, we need work. We need work in our lives, and we need it because it provides us with three things. First and foremost, work is necessary because we need to have a purpose. We need to have a goal, something in the future for which we can work and strive to attain. The plain truth of the matter is that we need goals in our lives to be truly happy and to be truly complete. Think about the last time that you were really sick and you stayed home in bed watching YouTube and Netflix, sleeping, maybe eating a little sherbet, drinking some Sprite. You might have enjoyed it for the first day or so. It might have been like a mini vacation, but after that, you got restless. You got bored. And in fact, you were probably looking forward to going back to work. And the same thing is true when we don't have a goal. The reason why you were bored when you were sick is because you weren't moving. But when we don't have a goal in our life, we are standing still in our whole life. The only way that we can actually move forward is to have a goal, something in the future that we can work towards. And there's the key word. No goal that we set will ever be accomplished without work, which is why work is necessary. Think of it like this. A human body is 60% water, up to 60% water. And now think of the difference between a puddle of water, water that is just standing still, and a stream or a river, water that is moving. Nine times out of 10, the water that is still is the body of water that's dying. It's full of algae and pond scum and probably nothing really lives in it. The stream or the river, the water that's moving, flowing, that has a goal, a destination that it is striving for, it's an entire ecosystem. Secondly, work is necessary because work actually teaches us virtues and skills. I used to work for a landscaping company and when I did, I usually worked here in this outdoor shopping center, weeding the flower boxes, watering the flowers, changing the trash cans out, picking up trash from the parking lot, you know, the usual. It was very dull, very repetitive, and I got tired of it very quickly, which is why I don't do that anymore. But I'll be honest with you, gang, it taught me things. It taught me patience. Well, it started to teach me patience. I'm still working on it and it taught me attention to detail. I had to be very thorough when I was going through the parking lots looking for trash. I had to be very thorough when I was going through the flower boxes looking for weeds. It ended up with my boss actually sending me more and more to private homes so that I could weed in their flower boxes because he knew that when I weeded a flower box, I weeded a flower box. There weren't gonna be any weeds left in that flower box after I was done with it. And every job is like this. I don't care if it's the dullest, most boring job in the world. If you are willing, it will teach you skills and virtues, which is a good thing because what this does is that it makes us not only more skillful and more diverse, but it makes us better people because the more virtues that we have, the better people we become. You know the old saying, a diamond in the rough? You probably know it if you've ever watched Aladdin. That's a very true statement. It means that we're all works in progress. A diamond in the rough, if you've ever looked at it, it's not very special. It doesn't look like much. A diamond in a ring? Now that's a, some pretty fancy jewelry. And that's what we want to become. Work is one of the primary ways where we move from being a diamond in the rough some, into something exquisite, something even more valuable than what it already was. Third, our work improves the world and people's lives around us. I mentioned a couple of videos ago that my grandfather was a farmer, and this is actually one of the fields that he farmed, if you can actually see it through all of the snow. In a world today of Walmart and Hy-V, we can sometimes forget that all the food that we see on the shelves in those stores starts off in fields much like this one. Now this is sweet corn. If I take a couple of kernels and scatter it behind me, 
they might sprout and they might not. I mean, they might sprout and they might not if there wasn't a couple of inches of snow on the ground and if it was spring. But those aren't very good odds. A farmer, instead, he'll take a tractor, he will turn the ground, he'll plant the corn, and then he'll cultivate the corn throughout the summer, and then in autumn he will harvest it, send it to an elevator where it can be shipped across the country and across the world for us to buy and for us to consume. It's through the sweat and the labor of farmers in their fields urging and nurturing the ground to produce a harvest that we can get food so easily today, which allows us to spend our time on other things instead of scratching the soil, trying to make our own food so that we don't starve. And this is the same for all types of work. Actors and writers entertain us. Construction workers and architects build our homes and our buildings. Plumbers and electricians make sure that our way of life stays the same. Railroad workers and truck drivers transport goods across the country and across the world. Take away just one of those professions, one of those lines of work and the people who work them, and not only would the world be a very different place, but it would be a much poorer place. Now before you start thinking that this is just a self-help video, let's talk about the second group of people, people who want to work but can't. Now we all want to help people in that sort of situation, and we might be tempted to think that of all the groups, yeah, people who want to work but can't, they might be the ones that the government is supposed to help. But this idea is just as bad as the first one. It's not constitutional, the government isn't competent enough to take care of people, and third, it's not the government's role or job to act as anybody's babysitter. So whose job is it then? Well, we see them every time we look in a mirror. And this just makes sense. If it's not the government's job to look after people and to take care of people who need help, then the responsibility falls on us. First of all, we know much better than some government bureaucrat who in our neighborhoods and in our own communities need a helping hand, whether that means us helping them individually or us getting together with our friends and neighbors and associations and groups to help people. But it's also our responsibility as human beings to be aware of the suffering and the needs of others and then to do what we can to alleviate it. You know, it's actually ironic and I don't think that they realize it, but ideologues are always telling people that it's necessary for us to love each other, to tolerate each other, and for us to be sympathetic to other people's plights and situations. And they're right, they are absolutely right. Those qualities are needed for a good society to be created and for a good society to be maintained. But one of the primary ways that we actually develop those qualities, that we actually become loving, tolerant, sympathetic people is by practicing charity, by actually helping those who are in need, us individually seeking out people who need help and then doing what we can to help them. When the government says that, no, you don't need to worry about that, we're going to do it, it robs us of this golden opportunity to practice and nurture those virtues in us and in our own communities. Because if the government says that they're going to take care of people who need help, then why should we bother? Why should we bother looking for people to help? And if we find them, why should we bother helping them? I mean, that's the government's job. Regardless of the intentions of the people advocating for it, a resolution, a deal, a system of government that tells its people that it's not necessary for them to work and that it's not their responsibility or their job to help their neighbors and other people in need is inhuman. It's cruel, not only because it once again is promising something that it can't deliver, namely a utopia, but because in that process it also robs us, it steals from us some of the core qualities that make us human. And that at the end of the day is the number one worst thing about the Green New Deal. But what say you? Do we need work in our lives to genuinely pursue happiness? And is it our responsibility to look after people who are in trouble? And if it is, how best can we do that? 
or in the 21st century is providing everyone with a basic level of living just another responsibility of the government? And can the government today look after people in need better and more efficiently than we individuals can? And if so, how can the government do that to the best of its ability? As always, let me know your thoughts, your comments, your plans down in the comments section below. Well, that about wraps it up for this week, gang. As always, if you liked the video, whether you agreed with me or not, then don't forget to give it a like. Every thumbs up you give it helps me along, guys. They really do. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel and to ring the bell for notifications because YouTube won't let you know anymore when I post new videos up. You've got to ring the bell so that you will always know when I post new videos just like this every Tuesday. Videos that you're not going to want to miss. Thank you as always for watching, for giving me a little part of your day, and I will see you all again here next week, gang, on top of the stone. Ciao.